In this session, we'll continue our study of higher-order list functions. We'll introduce a new class of such functions which are called fold or reduce combinators. There are several variants of these combinators, but what they have in common is that they insert a given operator between adjacent elements of a list. Another common operation on lists is to combine the element of a list using a given operator. For instance, to take the sum of a list, you would put a plus between adjacent elements of the list, or to take a product, you would use a multiplication operation between uh, adjacent elements. To cater for empty lists, so if n equals 0, uh, we, can, we, we deal with that by actually taking 0 plus in the sum and t 1 times in the product. So each time we take the unit value of the operation as a first operation here on the left. So that way the, our definitions of sum and product can also deal with empty lists. And that of course can be implemented with the usual recursive schema. So we could define sum takes a list of int and gives us an int. If the list is nil then we return the unit element zero. Otherwise we return y plus sum yS. Again, you might ask, how can I generalize that pattern? Uh, and in fact, it can be abstracted using the generic method reduce left. So reduce left inserts a given binary operator between adjacent elements of a list. So if you have a list of from x1 to xn, and we say reduce left op, then we would put an operator between each successive elements of the list. If we draw that as a tree, it would look like this one here. So we have a list um, uh, x1, x2, and so on, until we have the last operation takes the last element of the list. Once we have reduced left, we can express sum and product with it. So sum just would be uh, take the list that starts with a zero, and then following the list xs and reduce left with the plus operation. So it would look like uh, this thing here would be 0 x1 plus plus x2 and so on with a plus xn. And product would be the same thing except that uh, at the lower left corner of this tree here, you would have a 1, and as an operation, you would have a times. By the way, instead of writing uh, functions like this one here, two parameters, x, y, then x times y, Scala actually lets you write that also in a shorter way using underscores. So you could just write underscore times underscore for this very same function. The idea is that every underscore represents a function parameter. So if you have several ones, then each one re would represent a new parameter going from left to right. And the parameters then are implicitly defined at the next outer pair of parentheses. So that's why here you would read this expression as first saying, well, this defines two parameters, x times y. And here are my parentheses, so that's where I insert the parameters x and y that I have just synthesized, and that gives us precisely the function that you see here. So sum and product can in fact be expressed even shorter like this. Sum would be 0 followed by xs reduce left with a binary operation plus, and product would reduce left with a binary operation times. So by its very nature, reduce left can only be applied to non-empty lists. There's a more general function which is called fold left, which can also be applied to empty lists. The idea is that fold left takes an operation and a so called accumulator or zero element z as an additional parameter. And that zero element would be returned if the list is empty. So the idea here would be that you would use fold left like this. Here would be a list, then you would call fold left with the zero element, and then you would apply the operation as an additional argument. And that would then expand to the following tree here. And you say we have the zero element and x1, and that would be combined with the operation. 
and then an other operation would take x2, and so on, until finally the last topmost operation would um, combine the result of all the previous elements with the last element as right operand. So sum and product can also be defined as follows, using fold left instead of reduce left. For sum we say we fold with a plus and the zero element is zero. And for product we fold with a times and the unit element is a one. So here you see some possible implementations of fold left and reduce left as methods in class list. So reduce left, let's look at the type first. You would take an operation that takes two operands of the list element type and returns a result of that type. And the result of reduce left is again the list element type. The list must be non-empty, so in the case of nil we throw an error, nil reduce left. And if the list is non-empty, uh, so it consists of a head x and a tail xs, then what we do is we forward to the fold left method with a zero element x. So that's the element that will be returned when xs is empty and the operation that we have passed to reduce left. Now that leaves us with fold left. So the type of fold left is a bit more complicated. Let's ignore it for the moment. We'll get back to it. Uh, but let's look at the body. So if the list is empty, then fold left would return its zero element, the z. If the list is non-empty, then what we do is we have another call to fold left with the zero element that's now the operation applied to the former zero and the first element of the list. So let's draw this. So in the first iteration, fold left would be applied recursively with the accumulator of the first element of the list, which I call here x1, and the operation. Now the second call would then apply the operation to the zero that we pass into the second call, this, this subtree here, and the second element of the list. And so on, uh, our accumulator grows with each recursive call to fold left, until finally we are, have an accumulator that looks like that. And there are no further elements in the list, so the list is empty, and in that case we would return the accumulator. So it's a classic loop with an accumulator that implements fold left. So let's look at the type of fold left now. So we know that the list elements are all of type T. So I can write colon T for each one of those. The zero can be of a different type, U. Then to make things work out, because that subtree here is the next zero, we must also have that the subtree has type u and so on. All the subtrees have type u up to the result of the fold left. So that type annotated tree matches the type set that you see here. The type u is arbitrary. Zero has the type u. The operation then must have the type that takes a u and a t to a u. And the result of the final fold left operation is a u. Now we've seen that fold left and reduce left produ produce trees that lean to the left. So it would make sense to have a dual pair of operations that unfold to trees that lean to the right. These are called fold right and reduce right. Let's look at reduce right first. So reduce right puts an oper operator between adjacent elements, but now the parentheses go to the right, not to the left. So visually represented as trees, it would, like, would look like this. So we would have the first operation takes x1 and the whole result of producing a fold right of the rest of the list. And at the end I would have xn minus 1 and xn here. So we get a tree that leans to the right. Uh, fold right is uh, analogous to fold left. It takes again a zero element or an accumulator here. So we would, what we would see here, it would be something similar. It would be an operation that takes the first element and the second element of the list if it exists and so on until finally it takes the final element of the list and combines it with the zero here. So if the list is empty, reduce right 
would be undefined, just as reduce left does not define for empty lists. So if we look at the possible implementations of reduce right and fold right in class list, then here they are. So for reduce right, it takes again a binary operation from T and T to T. Would say for empty lists, it's again undefined. If the list consists of a single element, then that's the element that's going to be returned. And otherwise, it's going to be the result of the operation applied to the first element of the list and a recursive call of reduce write to the rest of the list. For fold write, we have a small typo here, so it takes a type parameter which is a u and uh, a, z a zero element of type u and then an operation. And its uh, implementation would simply be for an empty list, we return the zero element as for fold left. For a non empty list, we return the operation that takes the headed element of the list and the result of applying fold right recursively to the tail of the list. So to expand that out, if we had a non-empty list, what we would get is we would have uh, the first element of the list, x1, applied with the operation of recursively applying uh, fold right to the tail of the list. So let's say there's a second element, x2. Uh, again, a recursive call until finally we would have the last element. Then we would hit an empty list, then the result of fold right is set, so you see the same right-leaning tree that I've shown you on the previous slide. Quickly look at types. Uh, so the xn's again have all type t's as before. The z has type u. And then it follows that the operations must also return the same type u, because like the z, they are all used as a right-hand operand of a successive operation. And then u is also the type that's returned from fold right. So fold left and fold right produce different trees, left-leaning trees and right-leaning trees, uh, but maybe they produce the same result. In fact, if our operator is associative and commutative, one can show that fold left and fold right are equivalent functionally, even though there might be a difference in efficiency. But sometimes only one of the two operators is appropriate. So we see this in an exercise. Here is another formulation of the concat function that you've seen before. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So what we mean here is that we have do a fold right over a list xs with zero element ys and the operation is a cons. So let's draw that out graphically. So we would have x1, operation cons, x2, operation cons, and so on, until to the end of the list, operation cons, and then we would have the list ys. Okay, so how can we represent the list ys? How can we write that out? So let's delete that here. Well, the way we write a list is we write it as a tree of cons cells. So it would be y1 cons, y2, and so on, until yn and nil. So what do we see here? Well, it's just a single list that consists of the element x1 to xn and then y1 to yn. So that, f that shows us that uh, the operation cons here with the y as a zero element provides exactly the list that we need for the concatenation. Now, that was okay for fold right. Can you replace fold right by fold left here? In fact, you can't but uh, you should tell us what goes wrong. Uh, the types might not work out, the resulting function might not terminate, or the result might not be what you want. For instance, it could be the reverse of the result that you want to get back from concat. Okay. Uh, So to answer this question, let's simply pipe the definition of concat into our worksheet.
and replace fold right by fold left. And we get the error message value double colon is not a member of the type parameter t. So what happened here was, well, we do a fold left over a list xs. So we apply the operation to each element of that list xs, and that's a t, and in fact the operation uh, uh, cons is not applicable to arbitrary elements, it's only applicable to lists. So that's why uh, what the right answer is, we would get a type error in this case.